For this week's lecture, I want to focus on the theme of political philosophy. And in particular, I want to focus on classical political philosophy. Our textbook does a pretty good job of giving us a broad overview of what's known as modern political philosophy. And it does have the Crito, a reading from Plato, um, in that chapter of the textbook. However, I want to give us a broad overview of some of the different themes and ideas in classical political philosophy. So I think it's appropriate that I devote a lecture to that theme in particular, classical political philosophy. First, though, let's try to come up with a definition of political philosophy. One of the things you want to know is that political philosophy is a branch of philosophy. So just as there's a branch of philosophy dealing with ethics, metaphysics, epistemology, political philosophy is also a well-known and well-established branch of philosophy. A broad definition, but one that starts to point us in the right direction, is that political philosophy is the attempt to replace opinion with knowledge about the nature of political things. By political things, we can think of different kinds of governments, different court decisions, different laws that legislators pass. And we're all familiar with these. And oftentimes, we engage in criticism of one form of government. We might say one form of government is a dictatorship. Or one form of government, maybe a liberal democracy, is better than a totalitarian state. Okay, what we're doing when we make those evaluative claims is we're beginning to engage in political philosophy, right? We're asserting a knowledge claim about political life and political things in general. When we do that, when we make those claims or engage in that type of evaluation, we have to do so in light of a standard. So what would that standard be? I mean, how can we judge one political regime as superior or deficient to another political regime? Well, political philosophy, again, broadly speaking, aims to provide that standard, that standard of the best regime that we can use as a way to critique other regimes. Okay, so that standard is really important for political philosophy. If we're going to proceed from opinion about political things to real knowledge about political things, we have to look to a standard. Okay, And we do this all the time. When we're critical of a court decision, when we're critical maybe of the president or of Congress, implicitly at least, we're appealing to a standard. We're saying that this law is unjust because of whatever. Okay, well, we're appealing to a standard when we do that. So political philosophy, it tries to provide that standard for us. That standard by which we can evaluate and ultimately judge political phenomena, whether it's a government, a regime, a court decision, a law, a political actor, etc. Within political philosophy, we have two broad divisions. On the one hand, we can refer to classical political philosophy, and on the other, we can refer to modern political philosophy. Now, there's a big difference between the two, and a, at least one study question for this week deals with some of these differences. So I want to take a moment here and give you an idea of the major differences between classical and modern political philosophy. When you think of classical political philosophy, we have to go back to the Greeks, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. That's where we see political philosophy first emerge as a real intellectual pursuit. So it's going all the way back to Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And it's really with Socrates himself that political philosophy begins. Okay, as I've said in prior lectures, Socrates was one of these revolutionary figures who transformed the nature of philosophy 
and he did so by applying philosophy to the human things. Prior to Socrates, philosophers were primarily concerned with natural phenomena. They were engaged in what we would call physical science or natural science. With Socrates, that all changed. Socrates began to apply reason to questions of the human good, questions of what is the best way of life, what is virtue, what is a good regime, how should citizens be educated. And with Socrates, a tradition of political philosophy developed. That tradition was carried on by Plato and Aristotle, and other Greek thinkers as well, and ultimately it was carried on throughout the Middle Ages with thinkers like St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas. However, that tradition ultimately uh, came to an end, and a new tradition emerged, which we would call modern political philosophy. Okay, And it's really with the pivotal thinker of Machiavelli that modern philosophy begins to take shape. Okay, and building on the work of Machiavelli, you have thinkers like Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Marx, um, etc., who begin to steer political philosophy in a different direction. Okay, but it's really going back to Socrates where political philosophy begins. That's where it originated. Classical political philosophy, its central theme and the most fundamental question it seeks to answer is the question of the best regime. What is the best regime? I mean, what would that regime look like? I mean, what would that city look like? And really, to get at the heart of that question, the best regime will be a regime in which justice, ultimate justice, takes place, right, where everyone has their due, where everyone gets what they deserve, okay, and we'll talk more about that as we go, but we can say now that classical political philosophy focuses on the best regime, and that best regime will serve as the standard by which we can evaluate other types of regimes. Now, what's interesting is that the classical thinkers, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, were very skeptical that the best regime would ever come to pass. And we'll talk about this as we start to look at Plato's Republic. They think that Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, the classical thinkers, think it's highly unlikely that this best regime will ever fully be actualized. Okay, so that's a key element. So they're very, we could say they're very moderate when it comes to the idea of pursuing a regime that is completely devoted to justice. Okay. But ultimately, politics, for the classical thinkers, is subordinate to the human good, to the comprehensive good. So the point of political life isn't an end in itself. I mean, political life is really pointing to a higher life, right? A more fulfilling life. So politics isn't an end in itself. Politics should point us to that highest good, whatever that good might be. Okay, but there's ultimately a standard of goodness, these classical thinkers agree that politics is subordinate to. Okay, so politics isn't the end-all, be-all, as it is for many of the modern political thinkers. Modern political philosophy, as I said, begins with Machiavelli. Okay, Machiavelli affects a break from the classical tradition. So he wants to start a new tradition of political philosophy. He wants to start from scratch, if you will. And what Machiavelli effectively brings about is a lowering of the standard of what a regime should be. The classics set the standard very high. 
okay, so high they think it's actually impossible or highly unlikely for it to come to pass. Machiavelli, he want, he's a realist. He wants to focus on what is actual, what human beings can actually bring about in their lives. So he lowers the standard of the regime by subordinating the good to politics. So politics becomes an end in itself. That which brings about political order, stability, the rule of law, is the ideal. That's the standard. Okay, and regimes that don't measure up to that would be defective, according to Machiavelli. Okay. Now, I know this is a lot here, and we're just going through this real uh, quickly. The major point that you want to know is that for the classical thinkers, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, political philosophy is about reasoning about the best regime, constructing that best regime. Whereas for the moderns, they turn away from the best regime and focus more upon what we can actually achieve in our lives. So they would reason something like, why spend all your time thinking about a regime that can never come to pass? Why not construct a regime that can come to pass, and that's actual, and that's probable, and that's something that we can ground political life on? The good becomes subordinate to politics, in the modern approach. Okay, so let's turn to Plato's Republic. This is, without doubt, Plato's most famous work. 